for the good of souls. The gifts of the IHM sisters. This exhibit celebrates the 175th anniversary of the IHM congregation with a showcase of days and deeds from the lives of IHM sisters. Historical photographs, artifacts, and little-known details from the IHM archives offer a glimpse into the events and experiences that have shaped IHM sisterhood. In his account of the origin of the IHM congregation, co-founder Rev. Louis Florent Gillet wrote, I began, urged by the pressing need of offering Christian education in Monroe, without concerning myself too much about the future of that nascent work, leaving to God alone the care of blessing it and of making it prosper, if it were pleasing to Him and useful for the good of souls. Gillet embraced his life as missionary priest with zeal and fortitude. He toured on horseback the many stops that made up the extensive St. Mary of the Immaculate Conception Monroe Parish, preaching to the French and German settlers, often in their native tongues. Thus, out of necessity, he met the people where they were. And still, he wished to do more. In an April 1845 letter to his Redemptorist superior in Belgium, Gillet wrote, an immense field is open in this country to the sons of St. Alphonsus. The good that already has been performed by the grace of God is incalculable, but who can measure all that is yet to be done? I desire to be everywhere when I think of so many needs. Mother Teresa McGivney led the IHM congregation from 1942 to 1954. Beloved and respected by those who served with her and learned from her, Mother Teresa's visionary nature led her to extend the reach of IHM missions far beyond Michigan and Ohio. During her tenure, sisters were sent to Alabama, California, Florida, Minnesota, and New Mexico. And in 1948, she established the IHM's first overseas mission in Calle, Puerto Rico. To honor her missionary spirit, her urging for sisters to understand and love the children they teach wherever they are, the IHM sisters named her their patroness of missions in 1998, the 50th anniversary of IHM overseas missions. In this 1963 recording, Mother Teresa answers questions from novices about Puerto Rico and the missionary spirit of the IHM sisters. As you know, this is Mother Teresa. We met her for the first time when she came back from Puerto Rico, and now we're privileged to have her with us this morning. Uh, we would like to, to do this in a question and answer form, since Mother feels that that's the best way that we will find out what we want to know. Why did you choose Puerto Rico for your first missions? Well, we chose Puerto Rico because the bishop from Puerto Rico came and asked us to go. And we heard afterwards, every place that we went and said that we were opening houses in Puerto Rico, they said that's the most wonderful place to go because it's such a very poor place. And 15 years ago, it was much poorer than it is today. Today it seems to have advanced considerably. What attitude do the people have towards the First Sisters on the missions? Oh, they love the sisters. And if you drive through the country and see children, uh, uh, as soon as they see the sisters, they call out, Dear little sisters, you might be as big as a house, but you're <laughs> dear little sister to them in Spanish. Mother, how would you describe the faith of the Puerto Ricans? They're very devoted to our Blessed Mother. Maybe we hope that these people that we're teaching now uh, in their generation will understand the Mass and understand their faith better. But these people didn't have anybody to teach them, you see, and they've just had their own way of loving our Blessed Mother and our Lord. And I'm, they, the Lord probably loves them better than he loves us. <coughs> 
even though they don't do the things that we do. What exactly is the missionary spirit? And what are their qualities? Well, um, you have to be very adjustable. Do you know what that means? <laughs> <laughs> you just can't go to the missions and expect to find the missions as you find them here at home. And you have to um, be very generous, of course, and you have to be that anywhere, no matter where you teach. There's lots of generosity. You must love the people and the children, but you must love them wherever you are, because unless you love the children, you won't do for them uh, what God wants you to do. And children are very uh, keen on knowing whether you love them or not. They know that in no time. Either you love them or you don't love them. You can't fool children. So you have to love them, and you have to love their country and their customs. And they'll ask you many times, do you like our country, and do you like our people? And you always have to say yes, and of course you should, you should mean it. While this small globe cannot accurately document the hundreds of schools, cities, and parishes where IHM sisters have ministered, it stands as a visual representation of IHM global presence over the last 120 years. For more than a century, the dozens of parochial schools staffed by IHMs were all known as IHM schools. However, the institutions they founded and maintained, and in many cases built, are the ones that truly embodied the educational vision and cultural values of the IHM sisters. From the establishment of a young ladies' academy along the River Raisin in January 1846, to a 2007 partnership with the Bazillion Fathers to launch Crystal Ray High School in Detroit, IHM sisters have a well-established reputation for challenging and nurturing young people in IHM-sponsored institutions.
September 19, 1927. An academic procession and mass of the Holy Spirit precede the opening of classes on the new Marygrove College campus in Detroit. March 7, 1952. Mary Grove College President Sister Honora Jack is the first religious sister to receive the Woman of the Year Award from the Seroptimist Club of Detroit, a branch of an international organization devoted to the improving the lives of women and girls. March 9, 1965, about 50 Marygrove students, along with Sister Charlita Brady and Mary Ann Stanislaus Huddleston, join an estimated 4,000 Detroiters in a march through downtown Detroit to protest the violence against African Americans participating in the Selma to Montgomery marches in Alabama. May 13, 1945. To mark the school's centennial year, more than 500 alumni, including several members of the class of 1877, gather for the closing of the three-day St. Mary Academy Alumni Reunion, the first since Pearl Harbor. October 11, 1997, former Hall of the Divine Child Teacher, Sister Kathleen O'Brien welcomes more than 280 cadets to the first HDC reunion. Despite being a boys' boarding school, from the time it opened in 1918 until 1932, the Hall of the Divine Child housed the youngest of the St. Mary Academy boarders, known affectionately as Minims. 
This 1923 photo of the third grade class includes Miss Catherine Adelaide Duggan, seated on the far right. Nine years later, she would become IHM sister Jonita Duggan. October 27, 1941. IHM sisters from Detroit's West Side Missions visit the new Immaculata High School. The Holy Redeemer Chronicles declare, All concluded that it was the finest high school in the country. God is good to us. February 1st, 2005. Learning the school will soon close, Representative Danny K. Davis of the 7th Congressional District of Illinois offers thanks to Immaculate Heart of Mary High School in Westchester for more than 40 years of academic excellence and service. His statement on the floor of the U.S. House is a permanent part of the Congressional record. May 31, 1960. Archbishop John Dearden leads the formal dedication of the new Marion High School in Birmingham, now Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. June 6, 2012. Detroit Crystal Ray, a partnership of IHM sisters and Bazillion fathers, holds its first graduation for 46 graduates with 100% college acceptance. July 30th, 1926, the IHM congregation purchases the 157-acre Jacob Newcomer farm, purportedly acquired by Mr. Newcomer some years earlier, for a keg of whiskey, 20 pounds of tobacco, and a pail of fish. July 31st, 1926, the IHM congregation purchases a 276-acre farm belonging to Mr. Fred Humphrey that includes 22 cows, 56 sheep, 30 hogs, 60 acres of corn, and 1,500 bushels of oats. By 1936, St. Mary Farms encompassed 941 acres. The crops, livestock, and poultry produced there and in the Mother House gardens fed the sisters and students at the Monroe Institutions, Marigold College, and many of their missions in the greater Detroit area. By feeding so much of the community, this farming enterprise reduced the congregation's living expenses, supported ongoing building programs, and kept down the cost of tuition at IHM institutions, in particular at Marygrove College, thus enabling more young women to pursue Catholic higher education. This hand-operated corn sheller, built by the Hocking Valley Manufacturing Company around 1900, removes individual kernels of corn by pulling the ear through a series of metal toothed cylinders that stripped the kernels off the cob. May 16, 1998. The first produce and herb gardens are planted at the St. Mary Organic Farm on the campus of the IHM Mother House. The pursuit of higher education among IHM sisters dates back to the earliest part of the 20th century, when postulants were sent to the University of Michigan. 
At that time, Catholic universities did not admit women religious, and professed sisters could not attend secular institutions per church policy. In the decades to come, once some of the existing restrictions were lifted, many sisters furthered their higher education, earning master's degrees and doctorates from prominent institutions, including Catholic University of America, the University of Notre Dame, and Fordham. The smiling faces of these sister doctors epitomize the years of effort and dedication of the college student and the satisfaction of academic achievement. June 14, 1922. Sister Mary McGrath, the first IHM to earn a doctorate, is awarded a Ph.D. in psychology from Catholic University of America. June 1, 2006. Sister Lysandra Pedraza Burgos becomes the 80th and most recent IHM to earn a doctorate, a Ph.D. from Ohio State University. A hundred years ago, ratification of the 19th Amendment and the fight against the ongoing campaign to eliminate parochial education in Michigan brought many IHM sisters new and unusual opportunities to both march and vote against an unjust law that threatened their very foundation as educators. And in the last half century, the successors of these sisters have shown themselves willing to speak out to protest and to stand and march alongside others who do more than just talk about the need for peace, equality, and justice. October 31st, 1920. A march and demonstration are held in protest of a statewide proposal requiring all school-aged children to attend the public school in the district in which they live. As many as 100,000 priests, religious sisters, students, parents, and parishioners descend on Navin Field, the future Tiger Stadium, for the open-air mass and rally, led by Detroit Bishop Michael Gallagher. The proposal is defeated two days later. This detail from the panoramic photo shows habited sisters from several congregations, with IHM sisters clearly among the crowd. June 12, 1985. At a protest of U.S. aid to the Contras in Nicaragua, Sister Mary Margaret Davis is arrested at a peaceful sit-in at the Minneapolis office of a U.S. senator along with the members of the group Pledge of Resistance. Two years later, she joins a group of Adrian Dominican sisters in Managua, Nicaragua, where she would serve until 1992. November 22, 1998. 26 IHM sisters, associates, and friends once again join thousands of protesters in a nonviolent demonstration against the U.S. Army School of the Americas, SOA, at Fort Benning in Georgia, a training facility for Latin American military funded by U.S. tax dollars. February 23, 1994. IHM sisters are among a group of 500 concerned citizens who attend a Detroit Edison public information meeting 
to protest Edison's plan to discharge 532,000 gallons of slightly radioactive wastewater from its Monroe-based Fermi II nuclear power plant into Lake Erie. January 24, 1990. Sister Elizabeth Walters began serving a six-month sentence for trespassing as a result of a September 1989 protest at Wirt Smith Strategic Air Command Base in Oscoda, Michigan. The IHMs have a long tradition of welcoming young women from the same family into the fold. Founding member Teresa Renaud was later joined by her older sister Frances, who entered in 1852 at the age of 31. Mother Mary Joseph Walker, 3rd General Superior of the IHM congregation, entered two years after her half-sister Anne in 1854. In 175 plus years of IHM history, nearly 200 pairs and trios of blood sisters, as well as a quartet and even one quintet, have walked the path together as Immaculate Heart of Mary sisters, from Cyrilla and Edmunda Affeld to Wilfreda and Mary Agnes Zindler. Here we honor their love and commitment to sisterhood in all its forms.
Julianne and Francis Wolfe's mother died in 1918, when Julianne was just eleven and Francis was almost two. Their father left to take a job in Rome, New York, leaving Julianne with her nineteen-year-old sister Barbara and placing young Francis with friends while he was away. He would not return for fourteen years. Frances was moved from home to home over the next few years until she was adopted by Joseph and Helen Papp when she was eight. It wasn't until her tenth grade year, when her birth father finally returned to Detroit, that she learned she had two older sisters also in Detroit and an older brother who had accompanied their father to New York years before. Frances stayed with her beloved adoptive family but also developed some relationships with her newly discovered birth family. She transferred from Southwestern High School to Holy Redeemer for her 11th grade year, where she was prepared for her first communion by her older sister, Julianne, now Sister Mary Rupert Wolf. For 12th grade, she attended St. Mary Academy and then entered as an IHM postulant the following fall in 1934. These sisters, separated by tragedy and time, came to know each other as fellow IHM sisters during their many years in the community. Years later, Francis reflected, I, who had never achieved any roots, became rooted in a richness of history and tradition beyond human measurement. A sacred space in a noisy world. That is how Sister Eva Scholl described visitation, the IHM's House of Prayer community. Starting in the 1960s, the noise came from unprecedented freedoms and change, both in the church at large and for cultures around the world. Individual Christians as well as long-established congregations of religious had to navigate questions of spirituality obligation versus choice, purpose and charism. In all that noise, could they still hear and heed the Spirit of God, they wondered? The IHM community did not shy away from the questions. Indeed, these sisters led the way toward transformation, experimenting with the elements of contemplation, renewal, and apostolate. From the 1966 chapter on, they were instrumental in shaping a global House of Prayer movement. They engaged as individuals and as a congregation. They did, and still do, welcome all seekers, first at the Lord's Barn on the Monroe campus, soon after in Africa, Brazil, and around the world. Now, the spirit of that sacred space is continued at Visitation North, River House, Maxis, and the Margaret Brennan IHM Institute. Margaret Brennan took the founding committee out to the old horse stable on the north end of the IHM campus. Catherine Sienna Corrigan, Juliana Bruin, Mary Immaculate McDevitt, and Anne Mary Aquin Chester were there. As Anne records, a picnic table under the tree, covered in sunshine yellow, and topped with a basket of orange gold zinnias and red gold straw flowers, added a feminine touch to the rustic scene. As Mother explained why she had chosen that site for the house of prayer. At 5.30, Father George Van Antrip showed up to hear their plans. Mother's real reason for holding the orientation meeting of the committee at the site chosen for the House of Prayer was to consecrate the ground by a celebration of the Eucharist. We turned our conference table into an altar backed by the woods and completely covered by a linen tablecloth. We hung a banner among the branches, risen, present among us, and prepared the liturgy together, and then 
celebrated the Eucharist. April 4, 1971. On this Palm Sunday, the first public service is held at Visitation, the IHM House of Prayer, located in a former horse barn on the Monroe campus. October 17, 1978. Sharon Carolyn, with Sister Marie Hopkins as her friend and sponsor, becomes the first IHM associate in a commitment ceremony at the Visitation Barn. It is a great deal to the merit of the IHM sisters that they put the idea into practice in a very creative way. What then happened went beyond all my hopes and dreams. Father Bernard Herring in a letter to Sister Anne E. Chester, August 16, 1988. May 17, 1934. IHM sisters Rosalita Kelly and Vincent de Paul McGivney visit the Mother House of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, OSP, in Baltimore. The Oblate's records confirm that Mother Teresa Maxis, IHM, and Mother Teresa Dushiman, OSP, a woman of African descent, were in fact the same person. October 25, 2001. Mother Teresa Maxis is inducted into the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame at an awards dinner and ceremony in Lansing. December 3, 2003. Mother Teresa Maxis is inducted into the Monroe County Hall of Fame. A commemorative plaque hangs in the county courthouse. No photograph exists of Mother Alphonsine. Born Josette Godfroy in 1803, she entered the IHM congregation just six months after its founding at the age of 42, several years after the death of her husband. She presented the fledgling community with all she possessed, some furniture and $700. This generous sum, the equivalent of $24,800 today, went toward the construction of a convent for the group of sisters now numbering just four. December 8, 1859. Mother Mary Joseph Walker, is elected General Superior of the IHM Congregation. Bishop Lefebvre appointed her to that position eight months earlier following the dismissal of Mother Teresa Maxis. Built in 1904 and 1905, the Second St. Mary Academy was located across the road from the old Mother House and Academy complex, with its buildings dating back to 1866. 
This five-story structure of red-pressed brick and stone served as St. Mary College and Academy until Marygrove College opened in Detroit in 1927. The Academy, pictured here soon after it was built, was destroyed by fire on June the 3rd, 1929. It had recently undergone extensive renovations, completed just two months earlier. Fire departments from three nearby cities were called to assist Monroe firefighters battling the blaze, which burned all day and into the night. Mercifully, no one was killed or seriously injured. June the 3rd came. The uh, June 1st that year fell on Saturday, and that was the alumni day. Everything was quiet over Sunday. June 3rd, uh, we were we had to go to Toledo, Mother and myself. We started out with Sister Alphonsine, who was one of the members of the council, and Sister Gertrude. They went into Toledo to see the sick and to visit the hospitals. Mother and myself went to transact business and get ready, start to get ready for the homecoming of the sisters. So we separated, but we were to meet at noon and wend our way home, which we did. We had gotten on the road home as far as Erie, but a little bit before that, we could see the great billows of smoke. But when we got to Erie, we knew that there was a terrible fire someplace. And Jerome, who was our driver, said, but he knew that fire was at the old car barns. And, of course, then we didn't pay very much more attention. The old car barns were a nuisance anyway. So uh, we didn't pay any attention until we got to the telegraph bridge over the river. And there, the whole west end of the academy, all you could see was fire. The whole west end, from top to bottom, and all you could see was Well, that was terrible. Sister Alphonsine... She just was stricken. She collapsed right then and there. Sister Gertrude, of course, had to take care of her. Mother and I wended our way up to Mother Dalmatilla. She was standing in the front of the old chapel just like this, perfectly stoic. Mother asked her about the children, and she said, all accounted for, and that's all. There were no other words. Well, there was nothing more to do except to stop, start and just just stand there and watch the rest of the fire. The building just went, except as I tell you. You have all of the pictures. There's no further story in much that can be told. I do want to tell you about um, Father Carnes was the priest who went in and uh, rescued the rest of the sacrament. And uh, put that away. And then he went back into the building to help the men. When he came out, he was shirtless and there were great blisters on his back from the heat. And it took Sister Gertrude some time and some days to mend his blisters. Uh, the library books, sheets from the library, pieces of books and so on, were picked up as far afield as Erie. There was a north wind blowing. And that wind, of course, blew everything south. And in Erie, Many, many pages from the library books were picked up and brought back to us. Now, you could imagine what was feeding the fire. We have a book on display that was picked up someplace. I don't know how it got off of the library and where it was picked up, but anyway, it was brought back to us. You have it on display today. Mother Domitilla Donahue, Letter to the IHM Community, June 10th, 1929. That memorable evening, as we beheld the blackened walls and smoldering embers, we shuddered as we considered what might have happened, and with grateful souls we thanked God that in the awful tragedy he had not asked the sacrifice of a human life. O oh, let us never cease to praise and bless his holy name for this unspeakable favor. For had the fire occurred at night, we can well imagine what might have happened. Dear sisters, 
The cross is a test of our fidelity, as one letter said so beautifully. Fire purifies. So it may be that the dross of earthly frailty will be cleansed from out our souls and that the rehabilitation, spiritual as well as material, will be nobler than before. St. Mary Academy was a principal source of income for the IHMs and, therefore, had to be rebuilt. Insurance came nowhere near covering the loss of a building valued at one million dollars. Five months later, in October 1929, the stock market crashed, plunging the world into the Great Depression. In addition to rebuilding the Academy, the sisters had to build a new mother house. The old mother house on the River Raisin was inadequate dilapidated and beyond repair. In the depths of the Depression, the sisters, already in debt for Marygrove College, had to borrow again, putting everything they owned as collateral on the loan. From the IHM Mother House Chronicles, August 6, 1931. Ground was broken for the new mother house. At 4.30 p.m., all the sisters from the Mother House and the Hall of the Divine Child, with our 77 novices and 60 postulants, assembled on the site of the chapel, and after singing the hymns, Heart of Mary Pure and Fair, Heart of Jesus We Are Grateful, and My Convent Home, Reverend William Flossiak, chaplain of HDC, blessed the spot. Reverend Mother Ruth turned the first shovel of earth followed by the members of her council and the bursar. The steam shovel started at once and continued until the closing period. That the sisters might form some idea of the location of the various divisions of the mother house, the W.E. Wood Company had marked the novitiate with white flags, the community with blue, and the infirmary with red. During construction of the new mother house, it became clear to Mother Ruth Hankard and Congregational Bursar Sister Miriam Ramo, pictured left to right, that the mother house chapel would have to wait. They simply did not have the funds. Over the next six years, Sister Miriam saved enough money to break ground for the chapel on November 10, 1938. After their first Holy Mass in the new chapel on Friday, December 22, 1939, the Mother House Chronicler observed, There was no sleeping during meditation, but I fear some were so entranced with the beauty of their surroundings that they were carried away from their prayers. While so many, architects, builders, tradesmen, donors, sisters, through their labors and their sacrifices, contributed to the creation of the IHM Mother House Chapel, Sister Miriam Ramo is considered a primary force that made it happen. Congregational historian Sister Mary Jo Maher said of Miriam, the great sweep of buildings across the front of our property is her crowning glory and the chapel is the jewel in her crown. This aerial view of the remains of the Second St. Mary Academy also shows the buildings of the Old Mother House and First Academy along the river and the newly constructed Mother House and Academy complex. September 6th, 1847. IHM co-founder, Reverend Louis Florent Gillet, is recalled to Baltimore and replaced as IHM superior by Reverend Egidius Smulders. February 9th, 1891. Having learned the congregation he co-founded survived and flourished, Father Gillet, now Père Marie Celestin, 
A Cistercian of the Immaculate Conception in Hautcalm, France, reconnects with them via correspondence with Westchester IHM sisters, Clotilde and de Chantel. Père Celestine joined the Cistercian community in Hautcombe in 1864, where he served as teacher, sub-prior, and eventually prior. In the photo on the left, he is shown, seated, while serving as novice master around 1877. The photo on the right shows his original resting place. The Cistercian heart from his grave is now in the Gillet Memorial Chapel. April 23, 1929. Construction of the Gillet Memorial Chapel begins in St. Mary's Cemetery. The recently acquired parcel of land adjacent to St. Joseph Cemetery in Monroe. Congregational archivist and historian Sister Rosalita Kelly undertook the momentous task of coordinating the transfer of Gillet's remains from France to Monroe. From 1926 to 1929, she corresponded with Don Bernard Girardi as they navigated permits, fees, and transportation across an ocean. The remains arrived in Monroe on March 10, 1929, and were laid to rest in the new Gillet Memorial Chapel on the Feast of St. Alphonsus, August 1, 1929. The original stained glass windows of the Gillet Chapel, including the one pictured here, were damaged over time and eventually replaced with plain colored glass. In the fall of 2020, the rear window above the altar was replaced with a beautiful new window reminiscent of the original. It was designed and built by the same Chicago company that constructed the chapel more than 90 years earlier. Thank you.